That's the wow moment. It's not up here, it's here. Um, wow moments, yeah, you, you can do it from a sophisticated technical standpoint, certainly. But you want people to feel it. You want them to have a tear in their eye or a big smile on their face or be cheering and clapping and so forth and so on. Those are the wow moments when somebody's dream has been exceeded. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. Do you want to become a Google Things to Do beta tester? In March, news leaked out that Google would be launching a new program for activities and experiences operators called Google Things to Do. Redeem is a Google Things to Do launch partner with a unique opportunity to bring a few qualified early adopter operators into the beta test. Interested in learning more about joining the Things to Do beta test? Email sales at redeem.com today. That's R-E-D-E-A-M. Hey, Josh, how are you? Hey, Matt, I am pumped up. I am excited. How are you? I am fantastic, All as right. if you have to ask. Um, <laughs> but I have a question for you. All right. When was the last time a random networking connection paid off for something tangible? You mean like the most recent? Sure. Well, let's see. The last in-person networking event I went to was in February of 2020. It doesn't have to be in-person, but... Well, from that, I was speaking at a conference, and there was someone who I don't even know who was in attendance who was speaking to someone else who oversees another conference, and I was asked to uh, speak at that conference. So that's... Uh, yes, I guess that was the last time an in-person <laughs> opportunity turned into another real-life in-person opportunity with a, there'll be a, a two-year pandemic buffer between the two. Uh, so that's, that's the first that comes to mind, but okay. Matt, there, as you know, <laughs> you know that I have many, I know that you have many examples as well. So what, why do you ask? Well, because today's episode is the result of a uh, a small networking opportunity uh, that happened uh, at the last Tell me. virtual conference for IAPA. Um, there was a session going on and Chloe, who is Keith James's daughter was in that session. She was observing that session and she had made a comment about manufacturers and suppliers. And I thought it was a great comment. And so I put a little note in the, in the chat, like most of those online um, conferences have. And uh, she actually didn't see it until just when the conference was over. She sent me an email. We went kind of back and forth and started talking about different things. And I said, you know, it'd be great to have Keith, your dad, on the podcast. And so that's how this, this, uh, this, con this conversation came to be, just from a, from a quick uh, comment and an and a email exchange. And now we have a guest. So this episode is brought to you by Chloe. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm really excited I, for this interview today. I, Keith James from Jack Rouse Associates. Uh, Keith has been in the industry now for coming up on 50 years. Uh, he was part of the opening team at Kings Island. He opened Universal Studios Florida. Uh, such a, a wealth of knowledge, such, a, such amazing uh, experience within the industry. And speaking of the word experience, that is a huge component of what JRA does to create experiences for the theme park industry, for uh, attractions, for cultural attractions. We talked about children's museums. And what I think is cool too is that we go out of our industry as well in this conversation to talk about the immersive experiences that 
we talk about all the time about how much we love them in theme parks and in you know tourism or leisure attractions, but also talk about how uh, they can very much apply to other industries as well, um, as as just some of the the topics of conversation in this interview. Yeah, it's it was really a wide ranging conversation, and what I really took away from it is that. There are so many things that are different in our industry from when he started 50 years ago or when I started 30 years ago. Um, there are a lot of things that are different now, but there are so many things that are so the, the similar or the same, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're still looking for that visceral emotional reaction as we've talked about with, with other guests. And I love the way that, that Keith talks about how you go about doing that. And I won't spoil it by, by talking about it now. I'll let Keith get into that. Um, but I just think that, you know, with all the technology that we, we now have at our disposal, all the toys in our toolboxes, as he talks about them, um, we have so many different options, but sometimes limiting those options actually makes us more creative. And I love right. hearing him talk about that. So i um, excited to get, get to more of that interview. Totally. And he has some great advice for young professionals in the industry who are looking to build their career uh, in this phenomenal industry. So I'd say uh, let's get right to this interview with Keith James. Keith James from JRA, thank you so much for joining us today on the Attraction Pros podcast. Keith, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. Great. Thank you very much for having me. This is, uh, I've been looking forward to this. Awesome. So have we. So Keith, can you give us a little rundown of your history in the industry, just to, in case people don't know about your, uh, your experience? Okay. Well, uh, this November at IAPA, I will hit my 50th year. Wow. I, I needed a summer job to pay for college. It's just like a whole lot of other people who started back then. And I was a theater student at the University of Cincinnati and my boss Actually, my counselor and teacher was a fellow by the name of Jack Rouse. And my mother was Jack's secretary and Jack had been hired to be the producer of all the entertainment for Kings Island, which was a new theme park being opened outside of Cincinnati. And as I said, I needed to pay tuition. So I interviewed for the job and was the stage manager in the theater at uh, the year that the park opened. And very soon thereafter, I became the assistant director of the entertainment department because the gentleman who was the assistant decided he didn't really want to be in this business. It was brand new and it was, he, he was a classical musician, wanted to stay in that. But uh, it was one of those things where I needed a summer job and 50 years later, I sort of have the same summer job. It's just the industry grew up. I'm not sure I did, but the industry <laughs> certainly did. So anyway, but that that that's how it happened. And I've had some very fortunate turns along the way. I spent 17 years with that company. It started as Taft Broadcasting and then became King's Entertainment. I was there for 17 years in the entertainment department, the design department. I moved to Toronto, I moved to Vancouver. My family and I moved to Sydney, Australia. And then we moved to Orlando and I worked for Universal Studios from 87 to 91. And I've been a partner and subsequently the owner of JRA since 1992. So that's, that's how I got to where we are today, um, sitting in my office in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, what was that like, uh, you know, 50 years ago, uh, you know, opening Kings Island and, and being a part of that process so early in your career and being able to uh, really see that park from the ground up, which has really become, you know, one of the most iconic parks in the country. Um, but curious, what, you know, what was it like back then, you know, when, when it first opened? Well, I, all I can say is it was, it was fantastic. It, 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 it was the greatest job that you could have in college with, you know, 3000 people your own age that you got to meet along the way. I actually met my wife, Patty, that summer. And, you know, we're, we've been married almost 42 years, but she was a performer in the theater where I was a stage manager. Um, but no, it was a, it was a great job. And back then, no one had any idea where the industry was going. We were all 
youngsters just enjoying ourselves. Kings Island did over 2 million guests the year they opened, which was a shock to everyone. It was tremendously successful, but of course they had the history of Coney Island in Cincinnati, which had been a tremendously successful park for generations. But it, no, it was, it was just a great experience. It was lots of fun. Um, you know, it, I'm, I'm lucky I've been doing this for 50 years and I have to say, I probably haven't really ever worked a day in my life. Um, and that all goes back to then. It was, you know, my, some of my best friends in the world are the people that I met then that summer. Um, Jack Rouse and I continue to be dear, dear friends. Um, we live about six blocks apart. <laughs> Dennis Spiegel, who most people in the industry know, uh, was one of the folks that hired me, Jack, Dennis, and a fellow by the name of Gary Walks, whose family owned Coney Island. They were the three people who hired me on November 11th, uh, 1971. That's the date of my letter. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I, I, I recommend the job to anybody. It's great. Now, back then we had no idea what we were doing. So we did everything that was asked. And, and so we got exposed to all sorts of things, which, you know, if you get that opportunity, I would recommend it. Just always say yes. If somebody asks you to do something, just always say yes. Yeah. Even if you can't do it, you've got a friend who can. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I love that attitude. Always say yes. Um, and then kind of figure it out later, right? Figure out how, how you can make it work, whether it's with, with a friend or learning a new skill or something like that. It's all, it's all about those opportunities. Pretty, pretty much, because like I said, we didn't know what we didn't know. So you just did say yes. And as you said, and as I remember, you always had a friend who could help you figure it out if you couldn't do it yourself. And what happened is things just got bigger. And maybe you had to have more friends involved. And the teams that built the other parks along, whether it was the King's Entertainment Parks or the Six Flags Parks or the Cedar Fair Parks or the Universals and the Disneys, you know, they were all built by teams of people who didn't know any better, so they all said yes. So, and uh, that's how we got here, and the, that's how we'll get to wherever we are 50 years from now. So, yeah. Yeah. So fast forwarding to today and JRA, can you give us a, a quick rundown of Jack Rouse Associates for those who might not be familiar? Sure. Well, as a, you know, the, the elevator spiel, um, we're a design and production company based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, it was oh, Jack and Amy began the company in 1987. I joined them as a partner in 1992 after spending uh, time at Universal Studios. Uh, we design and produce theme parks, museums, visitor centers, family entertainment centers, attractions um, all around the world. And uh, the majority of our entertainment work is international and has been since the mid 90s. Uh, the museum work is domestic and foreign. Um, we're probably best known in the museum world for children's museums and science museums. We've, we've opened them all over the world. Our theme park record, we've been involved in many, many big ones along the way. Several of the Legos, uh, Universal in Orlando, obviously Kings Island, the Kings Entertainment Parks. And because those projects are so big, that's where our reputation comes from. But we do an awful lot of work in the other industries as well. And uh, our staff's about 42, 43 people mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. We, we do have an office in Beijing, uh, but it's a marketing office. But other than that, everything is done, everything is led out of Cincinnati. We don't do all of the work on the projects because like I said before, the projects are very big and they take teams to do them, but uh, they start at our office in Cincinnati. Yeah. Keith, I'm curious. You mentioned a lot of different type of facilities there, children's museums to theme parks. 
Is your approach similar to each one of those projects or do you really take a different mindset when you look at kind of different, different audiences and different type of facilities? Um, that's a really good question that people have asked through the years and the process of doing the work is similar. For us, everything starts with a story, everything. And what happens is you go through different phases, whether it's concept or schematic or design development, some of the technical terminology from the architecture and engineering field, but it all begins with a story directed at whatever audience you're going after. And so they start the same and they expand and go off in different directions. And obviously they all are tailored to whoever the audience is going to be, whether it's children in the children's museums or uh, students a little bit older in the science museums, families in the big theme parks, uh, a lot of businesses in, in some of our corporate work where it's business to business work. And so, but it's still, what's the story you're trying to tell to the audience who you want to appeal to, but then how it gets developed. The steps are the same, but the teams are larger or smaller, depending upon what the projects are mm -hmm. and how long they take and so forth. What are some of the types of projects that you would do in the business space that, that seems like it would be, it would be different than the entertainment space and theme parks or children's museums? We, we did some work with Dell years ago where they would invite in their customers. We did have done a, we did a huge project for Volkswagen back at the turn of the century, 2000 called the Volkswagen Autostadt. And it was a huge automobile complex uh, they do about two, between two and two and a half million guests per year in Wolfsburg, Germany. And it's for the guest, but those guests also can pick up the car that they bought. Mm. And so it's, a, it's one of those things where, yes, it's guest related, but it's also business related. And if they want to bring in some of the people who they work with, you know, Volkswagen does a lot of work with Siemens. I'm sure that they have people from Siemens who come in as groups. And many of the corporate entities that we work with, oftentimes they don't charge admission. It's simply to promote their product. We worked at the corporate headquarters of to Toyota in uh, Plano, Texas. Um, we have worked on the Bourbon Trail for Jim Beam. Yeah. Um, and you know, where they, they appeal to their customers, but they want to tell the story of the brand. So it's not so much, uh, you know, Procter and Gamble appealing to their customers, but it might be a Procter and Gamble or a Toyota or a Ferrari or a Volkswagen appealing to the people who use their products. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's just a different mindset, but again, it's, you're telling the story of the brands. Yeah. It's interesting. You bring up Volkswagen and story and, you know, connecting with your, your customers, because I bought a, um, a beetle, a convertible beetle back in 2006. Mm -hmm. And one of their slogans at that time was, you know, Volkswagen's rock, you know, and they were really <laughs> trying to appeal to younger folks, I think. And sure. um, like, I don't know, a month or two after I bought the car, my wife calls me up at work and she says, you've got a package here from Volkswagen. And I didn't mm -hmm. know what it was. It was a guitar. It was an actual electric guitar, had the Volkswagen logo on it. And mm -hmm. it, it had a cord. You could plug it into your car and use the car's radio as its, as its amplifier. <laughs> and I thought that was so cool. I still have the guitar right now. I don't have the car anymore, but I still have the guitar. But I think that... Um, that, that, that kind of speaks to the story and kind of going to different lengths to really involve people in your brand that I don't want to say has nothing to do with your brand, but I wouldn't expect to get a guitar from a car manufacturer. Well, the, the, those sorts of things kind of have everything to do with your brand <laughs> because you're still talking about it. And what is it? 15 years later. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, so it's, 
you know, you'll remember that forever, whether you drive a Volkswagen or not, you did. Yeah. And so it's, you know, and it's just one of those things where it all comes back to people. They're trying to tell, tell stories about people to appeal to people to promote their product. You know, it's that that's really where, you know, everything we do gets back to the story that you're telling to the guests that you want to appeal to. And, and you know, it really, no matter what, you know, anybody in the industry who's in the position that I'm in or, or, or my, my friends and contemporaries is, you know, we would all refer to ourselves as storytellers hmm. in some form. And so... You know, I think that's interesting The you know, the brands that you mentioned, uh, you know, Volkswagen, Toyota, Jim Beam, uh, things that you wouldn't normally associate with, uh, with an experience. And yet they are coming to you, a firm that focuses on theme parks and themed entertainment and purely experiential industries and pulling some of what we do to incorporate that into something you would, you would not normally expect. So I'm sure that that's, uh, you know, it's definitely a rabbit hole and I'm sure we could, we could go down of whether it's, you know, retail industry or auto sales or bourbon, you know, as far sure. as what you are seeing trends in the future of industries that, that are, are not our industry, that aren't necessarily tourism focused or leisure focused or family entertainment focused, but wanting to take more of a page out of our book to to better engage people, like you said, that will ultimately purchase their product. Well, if people want you to, you know, there are a lot of buzzwords in our industry, but whether, call it lifestyle, call it what you will, people want you to live their brand. You know, they obviously want you to buy their brand because that's the business that they're in. But you know, we did we did the original uh, Crayola experience um, at their plant in Pennsylvania, and you know, they teach children. Yes, it's crayons that we all grew up with, and markers now, and so forth. But the things that they do, and you know, you 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 put the guest, or the user, or the customer or the visitor inside their world and they'll always remember it. And, you know, it's a very fine line, obviously at a certain point it becomes commercial, but if you remember it and you had a good time, chances are you're going to look at that brand favorably whenever you decide to buy whatever it is they sell the next time. You know whether it's uh, like your your not like your car, or um, you know it just hey, you know at least they'll get a fair shake. Now, obviously, if you didn't have a good time, they probably won't get a good fair shake. However, that you know that doesn't happen. If there's something wrong, they're immediately fixed yeah. the issues. But but you know the 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 other you mentioned retail and food. And, you know, gymnasiums and someday it'll be the retirement villages and things like that where people are, they're going to expect to be treated in the same manner that they've been treated for decades. You know, it's not a retirement home where you go simply to rest until something else happens. It's you go there to live until something else happens. And it's different, as in, you know, we we want people to live what it is our clients provide, and that's what we try to do is put the guests, put our guests and visitors in the middle of these uh, in the experiences, so they can they can experience what the brands want to offer, have to offer. Sorry. Yeah. And I would imagine that would I don't know what. I, I guess, you know, blur the lines of entertainment, retail, amusement, you know, all that type of 
those type of, of, of descriptors because you've got an, a, a place where you can go and be entertained and, oh, by the way, you can pick up your car, you know, or, you know, things like that. So um, do you see those lines blurring in, in you know, various industries? Well, I, I, yes, um, I absolutely do because uh, my, my former partner, um, Jack Rouse, wrote a paper made a presentation. I believe this was at IAPA somewhere in the mid nineties. And the title of the paper is what do we do when the whole world is themed? And, you know, so it was a little bit, you know, he forecast the future pretty accurately. Yeah. And, you know, people have come to expect wonderful experiences and they deserve them. I mean, people pay a lot of stuff, a lot of money for the things that they buy, whether it's clothing or a meal or a car or a bottle of bourbon or a box of crayons, a Toyota. Um, and so it's really a matter of putting people in the experience so that they know how it can be used as something other than simply a tool it becomes, um, oh, I, you know, experience is certainly an overused word in my world, but or in our world, but it it becomes part of you, mm -hmm. not, not not something that you you use it, yes, but it's not. Hey, you go out and use it, and then you put it back on the shelf. It becomes part of what you're doing. So. How does that then impact as we now relate it back over to the attractions industry and the theme park industry that uh, with, you know, with, with Volkswagen or, or Toyota, they can create an experience that at, at the end of that experience, hopefully you're driving away in a, yeah. in a new car. Yeah. Uh, and if you, if you really think about it, we're in the business of providing an experience for the sake of the experience itself. So you mentioned, uh, you know, Jack Rouse's paper on what do we do, you know, when the world is themed, uh, you know, how, how do we continue to offer that intangible product uh, as expectations are changing based off of what people are experiencing in other aspects of their life? Well, I, I think everything feeds off everything else. It's, uh, you know, but all the different projects help the other projects mature. You know, the, the, the offer that's in the different things, you know, I, I can't, I don't want to trivialize them. It's like a, a science museum is not simply there to teach. It's there to entertain as well, like a children's museum or an automobile experience is not simply there to sell a car. Um, obviously, that's one of the byproducts that, um, that people want. But I think if if we do more good work in retail outside of the park industry, then it helps the park industry. Uh, whether in food, same thing. The experiences, same thing. The storytellers that create the dark rides are the ones who create the experiences for the car companies. And you learn something at the car company that may come up that you can then in turn use in the park business. And, you know, the product of the park business is, you know, it's really smiles and memories. And so, you know, that's what we provide. We do it in a whole bunch of different ways, whether it's making you sick on a ride that goes round and round and round or entertaining you in a, in a show that is comparable to something that you might find on Broadway. You know, it's, they're, they're, they're things that, you will remember it's not for the spontaneous entertainment but there it, it is but you you take it with you um a lot of the stuff in the real world though applies back to the parks particularly nowadays with um social media and all of the different things that are way beyond my intelligence factor here, but the, the computer world and the uh, cyber world that everybody is in, 
We learn a great deal about that in our real world work that allows our entertainment work to become more sophisticated. And whatever we learn in the entertainment world allows the other things to become more sophisticated because the entertainment world tends to be able to spend more. So they can, they can push things further um, over the edge to make sure that you take the sophistication level as far as it possibly can go. And then what happens is it gets simpler and simpler and simpler to do and you apply it back to the real world. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, everything's feeding off of everything else. And, you know, we, we have to put boxes around the things we do simply in order to communicate to our potential clients, the different markets that we're in. However, at the end of the day, it's all for a guest or it's all for a visit, pick whatever noun you want to use mm -hmm. or pronoun. It's they come and whether they are a guest or they are a visitor, or they are a customer. Uh, it's, we do it for them. <laughs> we do it for the they yeah. and, uh, and, and all of it for, for them. So, and, and the, the lines, you're absolutely correct. The lines are blurred. Um, actually, I don't think there are any lines anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was curious too, Keith, when you talk about, you know, the different facets of the kind of the real world, if you're sitting and watching a stage show versus, you know, the social media aspect of it or the digital, does that make what you do harder? Does it make it easier? Does it make it more fun? So I guess my question is the evolution of all that. How has that impacted what you do for designing these spaces in these environments? Well, the simple answer is it makes it more fun because there are more toys in the toy box to play with. You know, so it's, the bottom line is it makes it far more fun. Now, given the sophistication level of what's going on, it's a challenge to keep up. Mm because the technology is outrunning brains like mine. It's, you know, I'm almost 70 years old and I, you know, I have trouble keeping up, but we employ a lot of young people who are really good at keeping up. And so, like I said, it, it, there, there are more toys in the toy box to play with and how you apply them is really the challenge and the fun part. It's overwhelming to people like me, sure, but that's because I, I get out of my depth really quickly. But it doesn't get out of the JRA depth because I work with really smart, great people who know how to use this stuff. You know, heaven knows I don't, but they sure do. And so we, we, we try to stay as current as we possibly can because things are moving so quickly in our business, we have to build stuff and it takes time to build stuff. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes by the time something's built, the technology we're on to the next generation or the two generations later or, or, it's, or whatever we started with might be obsolete. So it's, it's a, it's a huge challenge, but it's lots of fun. So. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. I, I want to talk real quick about something that is uh, one of the first things you see on the JRA website, and that is a statement that says designing dreams and delivering wow moments. And curious if, if we can expand on what that really means. Um, I, I love talking about just the, the concept of what a wow moment is. I have my personal definition of it, but would love to hear I, uh, what, it, what it means in the terms of designing dreams and, and how you execute that. Well, the dream part is our clients or customers or use whatever word you wish, come to us with a dream that they want to have realized that they generally don't know how to realize. And I work with a lot of people who are really good at making magic happen. And so that's why we're employed to deliver people's dreams. Now, ultimately, the guest is the person that says we accomplished it or not. 
the guest is not generally our client. They're the client of the customer that we work with. But our clients come to us with a dream that they want fulfilled and they don't necessarily know how to do it. And our delivery mechanism is gets back to what we were talking about a minute ago. What are the vehicles that we can use to exceed their expectations or to have them say, once something's open, oh my God, that's better than what I thought. Or if you're, it's like producing a show, you know, you want people to be on their feet before the last number is finished. That's the wow moment. It's the, it's not up here, it's here. Um, wow moments, yeah, you, you can do it from a sophisticated technical standpoint, certainly, but you want people to feel it. You want them to have a tear in their eye or a big smile on their face or be cheering and clapping and so forth and so on. Those are the wow moments when somebody's dream has been exceeded. And the dreams are the things that the people, <laughs> sometimes nightmares, the, the people come to us with and say, hey, I have this idea. Can you help me make it happen? Mm. And so the, the wow moments are ultimately in the eyes of the, one of the biggest wow moments is a five-year-old hugging, hugging Mickey. You know, okay. It's probably one of the greatest wow moments any of us ever had is when our children or grandchildren meet Mickey Mouse. Okay, it's simple, but Walt created Mickey. He created the wow moment. And we all want to recreate that as many times as we possibly can. Yeah. So, so what you're really getting to, Keith, is about the emotional connection that we have to an attraction or an experience. And, you know, that I think sort of transcends all the technology. And sometimes technology feels like it can get in the way or things are too technologically focused that you lose the emotional connection. You say, yeah, in my head, I can say that was cool, but it didn't do anything for me, yeah. for my heart or my emotions. So how do you balance that from a design standpoint? Okay, well, you know, I'll give you a, a cliche that will kind of explain it I, my background is in theater. That's what I have a degree in. Not the performance side, but the backstage part. Mm -hmm. And you never want the audience to go out whistling the costumes. Okay? The costumes are part. The lighting is part. The scenery is part. You want them leaving talking about the show. You want them crying, you want them laughing, you want them screaming, you want them scared, whatever. You don't want them talking about the technology. The technology is support. Always, always, always supporting the story. Now, sometimes the technology is the story, but again, that's when you're telling the story about a car or when you're telling the story about a computer. You know, years and years and years ago, we did something uh, for um, Intel and about the chip. And we created a character named Chip. And people remembered the character. And they, in turn, return, re remembered Intel. But you have to, you, you, your point, Matt, is very, very important. The, the technology is critical, but it's in a supporting role, mm. always. I'm, it's a very rare occasion where it would be the star. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and that's, that's from my background from 50 plus years ago in school. It's one of the first things, first lines that, you know, somebody mentioned to me when you know, the scenery designer was concerned that the performers were going to be standing in front of the scenery. Well, of course they are. <laughs> so, <laughs> hmm. 
that's that's a good point. Um, you know, and, and I think it it can be tough to absorb that sometimes when you're investing so much in technology that the natural desire is to want to showcase the technology for it being technology versus, uh, you know, I, I like to say that the the less people notice it, the better it's working, right? Or the you know the the more people are focused on the, you know, on the experience itself or on the, like you said, the, the performance aspect of it, then in, in many cases, or if the, uh, you know, performer is standing in front of the scenery, uh, it probably works its way better than if the scenery wasn't there or if it, you know, or, or if it wasn't as high quality, it needs to, uh, like you said, play that supporting role. I, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I, I think that can lead into too, is this balance between limitless imagination and realistic grasp of limits. And I also pulled that from your website as well. <laughs> I, and I think that that's such an, an interesting balance because it sounds like it could be contradictory, but curious as far as really where those two come together from the, you know, the innovative component of saying, hey, here's all the things that we want to do. And then saying, okay, well, this is actually the, you know, the, the box that it, you know, that it needs sure. to fit in. Um, and also kind of a, a second part to that question would be if um, you have any examples of something that seemed like it wasn't feasible until you get the ball rolling on those conversations to find out that you can do more than what was previously thought to be realistic. Oh, um, okay. That's a, that's a complicated question. I know it's a little loaded. I, yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. The, 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 um, and I just to touch upon your, the, where, where you were going on the, just on the previous side of the technology, the technology does want to be invisible because I think we all have seen the wizard of Oz. There's this story. I mean, Everybody knows the fact that you say you don't want to ever see the person behind the green curtain, you know, because all of a sudden it's the magic's gone. Well, ultimately in the Wizard of Oz, it really wasn't. But, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that the magic is invisible to whatever extent you can. Now, the limitless part oftentimes there's a very practical part to what we do and that's this is how much you can afford to do i mean there's a there are financial parameters at a certain point um but like we were speaking before technology tends to get less expensive not more expensive so you you might start out with an idea and say, oh, well, that's impossible. But by the time it actually opens, it's, it, it's possible. Um, or things are a, of a scale that a, when you start out, you can do it this big. But by the time you open, you know, you could do 3D projection this big and it was really good. But now you can do 3D projection on an Omnimax dome and it's really good. So, I mean, the, the, the magic, somebody figured out how to get the magic out of the bottle. Now, it's still what's on the screen. It's not, the, it's not necessarily the camera or the projector. It's the story that's on the screen, but the camera or the projector allows you to tell it differently or allows you to tell it the way you wanted to, but you couldn't when you started, but you can now. So it's a, a really tricky question. People's thought process can be limitless, but the controls really oftentimes are what makes it a real challenge. You know, how do, how do, you, how do you fit 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag and make it magic? Mm -hmm. Um, and it, the technology is allowing magic to happen more and more frequently. And 
you know, you asked me about a specific example that the big 3D stuff is probably as good a quick example as I can come up with because the technology has really allowed you to do that. Um, so it's, you know, that, and there are probably any number of things like that, 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 you know, if I sat here and tried to list them, I probably could. Just answering spontaneously <laughs> is a little bit, you know, you caught me a little bit off guard, but, but, you know, just people, the, the people in the business have tremendous imaginations and they're figuring out ways to take care of things. Um, I'll digress for a second, and this is something you may be able to edit or not, but <laughs> friends of ours in the industry are working with industry technology that may allow us to counteract the virus. I know you guys aren't old enough to remember the investigation of different light transmission when polio was so active. Now the virus did, the, the vaccination came around and so we were vaccinated and the study of lighting and its ability to kill viruses um, was not taken as far as it could have been because some other solution was arrived at. Well, people are investigating whether or not I hate to use the word cleanse, but whether you could disinfect with lighting, you know, certain on the spectrum. And by the way, I'm way out of my depth here, <laughs> but there are certain lighting registers on the scale that will kill viruses. Okay. What if you put a whole bunch of those in your office? Does that mean that people don't have to wear masks? Does that mean that people don't have to put up separations? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's a use of our technology going into the real world that probably will work. Somebody's going to figure that out before this mess is over with. Yeah. And, you know, so that we're okay for the next mess. <laughs> you know, this, this one seems to be being resolved slowly but surely. Yeah. But perhaps they'll come up with it in time to take care of Africa or India or some parts of them. I don't know. Yeah. It seems like a good idea, though. And some good friends of mine who are really, really smart are working on it. Yeah. Well, if you do figure that out or if your friends do, I'm going to put those lights in my office. Yeah, so me we, too. We, me we too. got it. Me too. Um, I'd like to change gears just for a little bit here, Keith, um, yeah. because... You have the, the, the um, uh, I'm going to say honor because I know Chloe a little bit. You have the honor of working with your daughter um, yes. in your business. And there's so many businesses in our industry that are family businesses. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, what it's like to work with your daughter in this business. And, you know, did you always think that she'd be in the business? Did she try to, you know, go do something else and come back? I'm just curious about that path and, and what it's like to work with your daughter. Okay. Well, the answer to that question is I love it. I mean, I, we have a great time. Um, she grew up in the company, so she knows everybody in the company. And basically, you know, our company is like a family. So she basically works with her family. Mm -hmm. Now, did I think she'd ever be in the business? Absolutely not. She went to school and got a degree in special ed and was offered four teaching jobs when she graduated. And she and her mom had a conversation about, you know, dad's company is kind of fun. Do you think I, I would enjoy it? And Patty said to Chloe, why don't you ask? And my only request was, Chloe, don't ask me. You're not going to interview with me. You're going to interview with the other folks. And that was over 10 years ago. And so, yeah, I, I love the fact that I, I see her every day and I talk to her, I travel with her often. She works probably more closely with some of the other folks in the company than she works with me. I'm, I work with her all the time, but she gets more involved in some details of some of the projects than I do mm -hmm. uh, just because the opportunity presents itself. 
but we have a great time. And I mean, you know, her, her personality is made for our industry. And, uh, you know, she's been heavily involved in IAPA. She's currently on the board and has been on many committees and did receive the Young Professional of the Year Award a number of years ago, which was mm -hmm. quite an honor that uh, her mom and I are extremely proud of. Um, and I know she is too. But yeah, it's, I have a great time and my, some of my friends who work with their daughters or sons, they seem to have a great time too. But I think the other thing you have to always take into account is our world is a lot of fun. You know, we, 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 we're in the business of making smiles and memories. So coming to work is enjoyable. Being with the people that you work with every day is enjoyable. Being with your customers and clients is enjoyable because if we don't fun, have fun, we can't make fun. I mean, it just, it just doesn't work. Now, people have good days and bad days. I'm not being, sure. I don't want to be um, Pollyannish about it. That's not, that's not the point. But, you know, she's got a great personality and fits really well in the business. And, you know, at, at this point in a whole lot of the industry, you know, I'm known as Chloe's dad. She's not known, <laughs> she's not known as Keith's daughter. And, uh, you know, in the other part of my life, I'm, for years and years and years, I've always been Patty's husband. And I like it that way. And Lexi, my other daughter, I'm Lexi's dad too. So that's the, that's the best, that's the best description and title I could ever have. There you go. Um, Keith, this has been uh, really interesting and we're, we're starting to wind this down, but I think we can tie this into uh, one last question for you. And that is for those who are young professionals getting into the industry, uh, who are just looking for the best ways to develop their career. Uh, what advice do you, do you have for young professionals who uh, maybe are early on in their career in the industry or that they want to pursue a career in the industry? Um, I get asked that quite often, generally speaking, because people know that this is all I've ever done. I've been doing it for 50 years. And we, we spoke about this at the beginning a little bit, and it's, Sounds a little bit silly, but it really is true. Always volunteer. Always say yes. If somebody asks you to do something, either do it yourself or find somebody who can help you do it. And there's no task that's too small. You know, people look at our industry now, hey, there's a profession, how do I get to the point where you guys are, or I am. Look, you know, there was no industry when I started. You know, it was just a summer job. And it was a great summer job. And so it's, the, the industry is so different now and it's so much more sophisticated, but I think some of the fundamentals are the same. Like do volunteer. Do say yes. Do make yourself available. Be curious. You know, uh, you know, be interested. You don't have to be interesting, but you do have to be interested because then you're going to learn things and you're going to be able to volunteer and you be in the right place at the right time. And that's, you know, that's probably as solid a recommendation as I'm going to get, you'd be able to give because, you know, I can't say go get a fine arts degree in theater. That happens to be what I have, but you could go get a fine arts degree in architecture or art or be a show producer or be an engineer. And any Chloe, a special ed teacher, you know, it, any, anything can apply because at the end of the day, we're in the people business. That's, you know, we don't make widgets that are being sold. I mean, somebody does, and I'm glad they do it well because I buy widgets, but that's not what we do. And so always, 
always be interested and curious and always say yes and volunteer because people need help. The projects are big and they're made up by teams of people who create terrific memories. And that's, you know, that's really, at the end of the day, that's what we're all about. Yeah. Well, Keith, that's a great, um, great bit of advice there. And um, I, I appreciate that because I, I run into a lot of young folks and the more curious they are, the more interested they are. Um, I feel like the more they are, they're ready to take a next step whenever that might be. And they're ready to say yes to the next thing. So I, I appreciate you sharing that as well. Um, if, uh, if somebody wanted to know a little bit more about you or find out more about JRA, where would you send them? Oh, our website would be the best place to go. And it's obviously www.jackrouse.com. And all of our email addresses are there. You can meet most of the staff. Our telephone numbers are there. Right now it's a little tough because everybody's working at home, but we do answer the switchboard and most everybody's, I think most everybody's cell phone number is on our website too. So, you know, feel free to call and, and we do, we are, we hire and we are curious and we're looking for curious people and we'd love to have people approach us. And our industry is small enough as you guys know that if somebody comes to us and we can't use them, but we think that they're a good candidate for someone else, we won't hesitate to recommend them in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, Kate, thank you so much. This has been uh, just such a fascinating conversation. We really appreciate the opportunity to get to chat with you today. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, for everyone out there who is watching and listening, just remember, we are all Attraction Pros. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.